37. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 14. It's what the word of God says. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro amongst them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I, as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy to the man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into the slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone, and we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. And God will bless his word to us this morning. You know, if you read through the word of God, you find also in Isaiah chapter 59 that Isaiah actually says that when, you know, the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard. And the enemy has come like a flood into our nation. A once godly nation is now widely godless. And, you know, you find that people today actually promote themselves the living for yourself seems to be more acceptable than living for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, being a true Christian today is unacceptable and upheld by many. Problems that affect people like you and me paint a dark picture all over our land. And it's like that people have lost hope for the future. But the good news is that in the midst of all the chaos, the Bible says that the Lord himself is empowering his people by raising up a standard. And that standard that the Lord raises up is more than enough for every problem that you would ever meet. And the reason why it's more than enough, because Jesus himself is that standard. Isaiah 59 verse 20 talks about the Redeemer coming. So Jesus is the standard, not a flag that you would wave, but living a life <clears throat> for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God doesn't want any of his people to be dominated by situations or circumstances. God wants you to dominate them by the power of his word. God dominates everything, rules and reigns, by the power of his word. And he wants you to do exactly the same. So just like in the days of Ezekiel, the Lord is coming to the aid of his people. The name Ezekiel actually means God will strengthen. And I want to say to you today, no matter how weak you are feeling, even if you're feeling like that word said, just weak and heavy laden. God is saying, I will strengthen you today. That's exactly what he wants to do. Not in just a natural way, but in a supernatural way. So you can feel the supernatural presence of God, even in your physical body. That's what God does. He's a great and a mighty God. So God wants you to be a people that rise up. God was never content with the children of Israel living in a valley of dry bones. He wants us to be people that would leave that place of despair and really know that he will come to our aid. You see, the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel, just like the church today, was well acquainted with the supernatural of God. The power of God moved in their life and in their midst. In fact, the word of God tells us that miracles, signs and wonders 
God used to bring them out of a place of captivity <clears throat> into a place of deliverance. And God today will use the supernatural power of wonders just to bring people into that place of amazing freedom. So the Lord did great things amongst them. He parted the Red Sea to prevent or to make a way to go forward into the promised land. He removed the obstacle, if you like, that stood in the way. And God will remove every obstacle that stands in your way to move you into the freedom that he intends for you. Now you might be a believer this morning, you might be saying to yourself, but I am a child of God and I am free. But are you as free as you ought to be? Are you as free as God wants you to be? You see, Ezekiel was a child of God, and I don't think there'd be anybody here that would deny it, but Ezekiel was actually captive in a foreign land. And many believers today are captive in a foreign land, in a place they should never be. And Jesus Christ wants you to be free and know his true liberty. Ezekiel had got his liberty taken away from him. Is he an area of your life? where that liberty has been taken away from you? Is he an area of your life where you're not knowing the true freedom of the living God? Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. And you and I know that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. What he did yesterday, he will do today. What he does today, he will do tomorrow. He's not changed. Therefore, his ministry has not changed. He will still set the captives free. His ministry continues through the body of Christ. This should be a supernatural body, as we've already heard today. In the book of Ezekiel, it tells us that God saw the people, the nation of Israel, the people of God, as dry bones without hope, spiritually dead. Somehow they'd lost the supernatural power of God. Somehow they'd lost the presence of God that accompanied them. And now by all accounts, they were in a valley of dry bones, a valley of defeat. Maybe you feel like that today. The good news is, the Bible tells us where Ezekiel was concerned, he says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me out. When the hand of the Lord is upon you, he will bring you out of sickness. He will bring you out of disease. <clears throat> he will bring you out of that place of despair and loss of hope. He will bring you out of poverty. But you need the hand of the Lord to do that. You can try natural remedies and they may seem to work for a season, but they will have no stability within them. It's only the Lord that gives you true freedom. So the Bible is saying where Ezekiel was concerned, Ezekiel was brought out by the hand of the Lord. God moved him from one place to another. And God wants to move you from one place to another supernaturally. All the way through the word of God, there were people that were physically moved from one place to another. <laughs> Elijah experienced being physically moved. How could he hide from uh, Ai for all those years? He was physically moved. Even the school of the prophets recognized that the Spirit of God moved him from one place to another. If those things happened under an old covenant, why should they not be happening in your life and in your experience? God moved him supernaturally to show him something he'd never seen before to bring him into a place where he could encounter the presence of God and move to a greater level in God. So the Bible says the hand of the Lord was upon me. The Spirit of the Lord moved him. And he says the Spirit of the Lord set him in the middle of a valley. And that valley was full of dry bones. Look, if I wanted the Lord to move me, I'd think, Lord, move me on a mountaintop. You know why? Because a mountaintop, people experience the presence of God. Moses encountered the presence of God. He waited on the presence of God for six days. And on the seventh day, God called him supernaturally to enter that cloud. And God sustained him so that he had no physical desires. God absolutely sustained him. So I want a mountaintop experience, wouldn't you? Elijah defeated the enemy on the mountaintop. Wouldn't you want that mountaintop experience to defeat your enemy? Jesus Christ himself was transfigured on a mountaintop. He came radiant with light. He showed his true, his true appearance because Jesus Christ is light. In his presence is light, the Bible says. <clears throat> so when you come into his presence, you become more like him. And you need to start to practice the presence of God. You need to come into his presence. So I've been looking 
for a mountaintop experience. But where does God take Ezekiel? He takes him to a valley full of dry bones. If you're in the valley, if you're at the bottom, it's often not a good place to be. The very fact that there was dry bones there shows it was a valley of defeat. Defeat. In the ancient Israel, you would find that when an army was defeated, they would not afford them the rights or the privileges of burying them. The word of God would tell you, they just basically stripped them bare and the birds of the air picked off their flesh. So what you see is a valley of defeat where there's all these dry bones and those dry bones may have been there for a long period of time. They weren't all together like a full skeleton. They were scattered. And that's like the people of God today that we're not representing the true likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like they're all scattered. Dry bones here and dry bones there. In that valley of dry bones, those bones would have been gnawed on by animals, dragged across that valley to different places. So to put those pieces back together again would appear to be an impossibility naturally. Amen. But we're not trusting in a natural God. We're trusting in a supernatural God who has made you in his image and likeness and you are made to flow in the supernatural. So when you're getting confirmation of the word that was given to you today, <clears throat> to flow in the supernatural of God. So Ezekiel is brought to that place and he's seen this place full of dry bones. And the Bible says that the Lord led him to and fro amongst them. And he says, I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. So he assessed the situation. And if you were to look at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today, even though this passage really refers to the nation of Israel coming together, but it has more than one meaning. We can look at this and say, this is the state the church is. It's not flowing with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that he wants to. What would happen if you was to stand before the Lord and he was to say to you, what have you done for me this week? What would you say? I rolled up at church, 20 minutes late, half an hour late. What would you say you've done? I went to a praise meeting. I sung a few songs. What have you done for his kingdom? The church is dry. It's like dry bones. It's like scattered all doing their own thing. I mean, all the wrong meetings, the wrong gatherings, never seeing the common good of advancing the kingdom. We're to be people that advance the kingdom of God. God caused Ezekiel to see, as far as he walked, that bones were scattered. And as far as you would walk today, you will find that bones in the church are dried out and scattered. And you should be radiant with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the word of God is very clear. It tells us that his word is sharper than the two-edged sword. It penetrates what? Bone and marrow, soul and spirit. Every part of your personality should be vibrant with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. It really should. Ezekiel has seen it as it is. And the Bible tells us that he saw it and it were very dry. Not just dry, very dry. And God says to him, he says, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? So God is asking Ezekiel a question. And Ezekiel answers the Lord and says, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Why would God ask Ezekiel, can these bones live? Because God wanted Ezekiel to see things from his perspective. And you have got to start to see things from God's perspective. You see, Ezekiel saw a valley of very dry bones. But God can see life in apparent death. And he may look at your life. And he may say, your prayer life's died, but I can resurrect that. He may say, your, your desire, your passion for Jesus Christ has waned, but I can resurrect it. And some of us are like dry old bones, become creaking into the church. <clears throat> when God wants to loose 
is marrow within you. <coughs> He's anointing within you. He's such a great and a mighty God. He wants to bless you in an abundant way. Mm -hmm. So God is asking him to locate where Ezekiel is at. And as a believer today, you should be in agreement with the things of God. You know when you read through the book of Revelations, and it tells you that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and what the word of their testimony. Mm -hmm. When he's saying the word of their testimony, it's not saying, well, I was on the bus today and a man sat next to me and I, and I shared with him about Jesus Christ. He's not talking about that type of testimony. He's talking, when he uses the word testimony, it means to say the things that agree with the word. So you're overcoming by saying the things that agree with the word. What does God say about your situation? What does God say about your life? What does God say about the impossible situations? He says, there's nothing impossible for me. And there's nothing impossible for him who believes. And you're going to believe the word of God. And you've got to testify from his perspective. So in everything that you do to be an overcomer, to win through in your life, you've got to be in agreement with the word of God and not in agreement with the enemy. Listen, the enemy brings things upon you. I was a little bit rough this week. I've never known me a little rough. And so I said to Anthony, I'm going in the, going into a room so I'm not disturbing you. And I was praying. Nothing was moving when I was praying. And I changed the way I prayed. In other words, I recognized difference in spiritual warfare changes and I changed the way I was praying. And my lungs felt they were on fire. I coughed. <laughs> the pain was there. I began to pray. Still did free meetings through the week, by the way, preaching. What's that home? Something loves it. Stand on the word of God. And I began to pray and I just said, Lord, I'm just going to plead the blood. Thank you for the power of the blood. For his blood had gone. Father, I plead the blood. I sprinkle the blood right now. In the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Fifteen minutes into sprinkling the blood, mm -hmm. the pain goes completely. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying, we've got to start to stand on the word of God mm -hmm. and believe what God says and agree with what God says, even if it looks an impossible situation. What impossible situation do you have in your life? Mm -hmm. You need to start to agree to the word of God. So God is showing him these principles. And he says, when he answered this, you will all know. He said, then he said to me, so Ezekiel is clearly hearing the word of the Lord. Prophesy <coughs> to these bones and say to them. So God is telling him the key in this situation is to prophesy. To speak forth the word of God. Say to them. Who's he speaking to? The bones. The dry bones. And he says say to them. Dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. So God is telling him. What to say. When a prophetic word comes. It's a word that comes from the Lord. And so God is showing us. That to prophesy into your situation. What you intend to happen. What you desire. In the heart of God to take place. You've got to prophesy to it. What about you prophesying. To your own life. What about you prophesying. That you have more of the spirit of God. What about you prophesying. That God would raise you up. With such boldness and confidence. That you would represent him well. Wherever he would take you. That he would use you. What about prophesying these things. Ezekiel is told to prophesy. To dry bones. To speak to those dry bones. And the great thing is, God shows him the words to say. Amen. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you Amen. and you will come to life. Amen. So he's prophesying that. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you and you will come to life. <clears throat> then you will know that I am the Lord. And Ezekiel said, so I prophesy as I was commanded. There's lots of people prophesy today, but it's not as God commands. Yes. I think it's just figments of their own imaginations. Mm. They prophesy things to people just to make them feel good. Mm. Yeah. But I'm not here to make you feel good, as you probably know. <laughs> I'm here to make you advance in the things of God and grow in the things of God. Ezekiel was told exactly what to say. And God will tell you exactly what to say in any situation 
you face if you care to come before him, if you include him in your life and you're faithful to speak out what he tells you to say, it will produce after its kind. You've got to say what God has called you to say. Mm -hmm. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't think, well, that doesn't really explain it too much. I'll add a bit on. Mm -hmm. God has never told you to add anything on. Mm -hmm. It's up to be obedient to his word. If he gives you one sentence to say, say it. Because what God will do, <laughs> he will show his power in that one word, mm -hmm. or that one right. sentence. Yes, right. And if you start to embellish it, it will deplete that power flowing mm. because it cannot work through a disobedient vessel like that. Yes. He's looking for obedience. Amen. Ezekiel was obedient to the word. He says, I prophesied as I was commanded. In other words, I not only opened my mouth, but the words that came from my mouth, I prophesied. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And he was thinking, you know, you know, Donald Trump, He's like the uh, president of America to be, isn't he? <laughs> Many years ago, he was a, a prophet of God. He's with the Lord now. And he prophesied that Donald, Donald Trump would have two terms in the White House. So he prophesied. He spoke that out. Donald Trump entered the White House, and then when it was time for the vote for re election, he lost that re-election to Joe, Joe Biden. <laughs> he has been a man. <laughs> he lost that election. And many people thought, well, his prophecies failed. <laughs> his prophecies not work. But God never said he would serve two terms one after another. <laughs> it was a gap in between. Yeah. Nice. And sometimes we prophesy things and it doesn't quite work out the way we think. Mm -hmm. And we think that God is not working. Mm -hmm. This happened in Ezekiel's life. Ezekiel, the Bible says, so I prophesied and I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. There was a rattling sound and bones came together, bone to bone. And they looked and tendons and flesh appeared on the skin and it covered them. But there was no breath in them. So he's prophesied something, and it's only like partial prophecy has been fulfilled. Mm. Listen, never let go mm. when it's partial prophecy. Mm. Never think, well, God hasn't quite done it. I wasn't have heard from God correctly. Mm. He prophesied as he was commanded, but he's seen partial work of God taking place. Mm. And when you start to prophesy, and speak the word of God, he will always start to work. What does the Bible say? When the spirit of God started to work, there was a rattling. I tell you, when God's spirit moves, he rattles a few cages. He rattles a few people's lives who don't like it. People don't like the supernatural. It disturbs them because it disturbs what's within them. So when he started to prophesy, there was a rattling of those bones. Could you imagine if this was a vast army that had died, there may have been 40 or 50,000 there. Something that you never see in the Etihad. <laughs> but 40 or 50,000 may have been there. <laughs> a valley of great bones. Can you imagine the noise it made? Again, something you never seen yet. <laughs> a great noise was made. And these bones started to come together, bone to bone. That reminds me of creation. In fact, I would think this is how God created. Maybe this is a picture of how God created the order how he created a human being. But bone came to bone. He didn't say, hold on a minute, I don't belong here. I don't fancy being a joint to this one. Bone came to bone. And the Bible says it was a sound, a noise, a rattling sound. When God moves, there is always noise. You know, Adam heard the sound of the Lord in the garden. There's always noise. All the way through the word of God, you heard the sound. The day of Pentecost, they heard the sound. Like a violent rushing wind. 
The Holy Spirit is not a wing. The Holy Spirit is a person, the third person of the Trinity. He's the third person of Trinity, not that he's the least in the Trinity, but he's the third person revealed to us. That's how equal in power and status to the Lord. He's not a force or a thing. He's a person Amen. that can be loved and honoured and obeyed the same way as Jesus. The Holy Spirit starts to move. There's always a noise. There's a noise. People cry. People laugh. People scream. You've been in a meeting where the presence of God moves. That's exactly what happens. I was praying for a few people this week. There's some crying. Some laughing at the end. Some hissing the way through. Because God is dealing with a person's life. Is changing their lives. There's a noise. Don't be afraid when you hear some noises. Don't be afraid of those things. The Spirit of God moves. Is if you're starting to hear, first and foremost, he heard the rattling sound, that noise, and bones began to come together, bone to bone. And he says, and I looked. He's hearing the noise. He's hearing his spiritual senses. To hear the things of God are now activated. But then he says, and I looked. So he's not content in just hearing the voice of God. There's more. How many of you today are just content with hearing the voice of God? God says, my sheep hear my voice. So if you're a sheep, you should be hearing his voice anyway. But God doesn't just want you to hear, but he wants you to see. If you can't see what you can hear, you're handicapped. God doesn't want you handicapped. He wants you whole in Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us then, he looked. I looked and tendons, flesh appeared on, the, on them and skin covered them. But there was no breath. So he's seen a supernatural act of God. A body coming together that has an appearance. But there's no life in it. How many of you today have an appearance of being a believer? How many people do you know today that have an appearance of being a believer, but there's no true life or breath of God flowing through you? <clears throat> you just look to be the part. He's seen a vast army stand before him. Bodies stood before him. That appear to be okay, but there's no breath of life within them. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You need to be filled continuously, not one off, a one off occasion. You can't rely, well, I got saved 10 years ago, God filled me with the Holy Spirit. You've leaked out all over the place since then. You need to be filled on a regular basis. This is what the Apostle Paul told the church. To be filled with the Spirit. And the word he uses imply to be continuously filled. Amen. Because as you give out, as you pour out, God wants to pour in. Amen. But we need to be people that have more than an appearance. We need to live the life that God has intended us to do. And I believe that God is starting to move his church to live the life. He's refining. Amen. It's like God has sent out and the flower is flowing through and the lumps are being removed. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that all over the world that there's a refining that God is starting to take place. Mm -hmm. He wants people to have more than an appearance. You know, Jesus said to those that had an appearance, the Pharisees, he says, you like whitewashed tombs. Mm -hmm. You like a grave that's on that that people walk over. And God doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to be people that not only show his presence, but live in the power of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Ezekiel saw all these things happening, but he noticed the one thing that was missing. You know what, folks? I'll tell you straight. If someone came, 20 people came and gave you a word of encouragement, you'd be uplifted. But if one person came along and gave you a word of discouragement, the one word you would remember going on would be that one word of discouragement. 
Ezekiel is looking. He's seeing sinews. He's seeing bones coming together. He's seeing flesh. But he notices there's no breath. We should be people that notice when there's no real breath of God in another believer. In other words, they're not flowing under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I've met many believers that are incomplete because they don't flow under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You see, Calvary's cross, we've talked about it today, is the beginning of a much wider process. Being born again is the beginning of the journey of what God wants to take you in. There's more for you to experience than you've got right now. But are you content with what you've got? I'm just happy with what I've got. God wants you to desire more in the things of God. Yes, God will just be content with his great gain. Just talking about the things around you, the superficial things. But where the presence of God is concerned, you should never be content. You should desire more of him and to flow under that supernatural anointing. So Ezekiel noticed what was lacking in the lives of those around him. I wonder if you notice what was lacking in the lives of those around you, but in your own life as well. I like what Benny said yesterday, God will reveal you, said this last week, God will reveal you to you. That's God. Cool. God will not only reveal himself, he will reveal the true you to you, so that he can start to change you into his true image and likeness. You've got to see your deficiency. Ezekiel saw the deficiency in what he had prophesied about. He saw the prophetic word work in part, but not complete. And the main part that was missing was the main part, the breath of the Lord Almighty. So what does God say? God speaks to him and he says, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, breathe into the slain and they may live. So I prophesy as he commanded me and breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet a vast army, the King James says, an exceedingly great army. So God told him again to prophesy. And sometimes you need to prophesy into situations more than once. You bring a certain thing around, but then you just get that fresh anointing from God to speak again. And so he spoke again. This time he's praying for the breath of God to come from the four winds. The word breath can mean wind, it means spirit. He's asking for the spirit of God to fill them because it's the spirit that brings life. Didn't God, when he created man, he formed him, the Bible says, from the dust of the ground. In other words, God picked him up, made him, just like you would make modeling clay into an image, he made him. But then the Bible says, God breathed into him. So his breath came into him and he became a living being. You only become a living being when you've got the breath of God in you. You become a dead being, human being, not a baby being. You become a dead being, when that breath is gone, when your spirit departs. So Ezekiel was commanded to prophesy the breath of God to come into that which is dead. You need to prophesy into dead situations, dead circumstances, even your dead body. The areas are not functioning as they ought to do. You have got to prophesy the breath of God, the life of God, to come into those situations. I'm not talking about praying about it. I'm talking about prophesying, speaking the word of God. What God says, what you're hoping for. And so Ezekiel was obedient to the word of God. And then he noticed that there was a change take place. I prophesied as commanded, and breath entered them. And he says, when that breath entered them, they came to life and stood. When the breath of God comes into you, it causes you to come alive and to stand for Jesus like never before. There's too many floppy Christians. They're on the floor. Wish-washy believers. 
that are overpowered by every problem they face. And it's because there's no real breath within them. But when the breath of God comes into you, a courage, a boldness, an ability, a strength enables you to stand. And God wants you to stand. To stand for what? To stand up for what you believe in. To stand up for Jesus Christ. To make a stand when no one else will. This body became alive and stood. And he said they stood there an exceedingly or a vast army. In other words, they stood in rank. They stood in order. And God is looking for the body of Christ to stand in rank and to stand in order. No one's seeking to be stood where someone else is stood or to occupy their position. But to stand in the place where God has called you. And you need to stand up for Jesus and be accounted for. Instead of thinking you're serving Jesus, I'll do anything for you, Jesus. Except go to church on a Sunday morning. Except come to a midweek gathering. Except witness to people on the street. But I'll do anything for you. You need to start to stand up. The breath of life changes you. God wants an army that would stand in rank and order. And God isn't putting a man in charge of that. He's putting the truth. Lamb of God in charge of that army, the captain of the house. He's the one that tells us what to do. So this army stood there. What were that army waiting for? That army was waiting for the command of God. Notice it was an army, not a congregation. An army. And God wants you to understand that you are meant to be a seasoned soldier in the Lord. And not backing down every time the enemy says boo. We've got to stand for the things of God. And stand on the word of God. So he breathed, breath entered them. And they came to life and stood upon their feet. On your feet. I were in the army. Don't know if many of you know that. Not for very long. Five months and 27 days. <laughs> I got services no longer required. <laughs> but I might be thrown out of the British Army. But God invited me into his. <laughs> but one of the things he used to do in the army, he used to come in about five o'clock in the morning and he'd say, On your feet. And you have to shoot out your bunk bed or off your top bunk and stand on your feet. God is telling, or is saying in his word, that to stand on your feet is to be alert, it's to be upright. And God wants his people upright, not laying down. Amen. Absolutely upright. So all these bones that were on that valley all started to stand up, and they stood upright and vast down there. Ezekiel is listening to the Lord. He's not getting overexcited at what is taking place because he's in constant communion with God. So he's not just hearing the voice of God once, God is speaking to him re repeatedly. That's relationship, isn't it? He's got relationship. And he said, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. The Bible is interpreted who they are. That's the nation of Israel. But it also speaks to the church today. The nation of Israel, those scattered bones, all came together, I think it was in May 1948. They came together as a nation. But God is yet to breathe his life into them like the way they should, where that nation becomes born again by the Spirit of God. Amen. The secular at this minute in time, holding on to the old religion instead of moving into the things of God. But God is basically saying to them, this is the whole house of Israel, these are my people. And God is saying to them today, he is saying what the people said, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone and we're cut off. You ever have disappointment come into your life, despondency, some sort of discouragement? It affects you. It affects your countenance, the way your posture is, your head goes down, you start to lose hope. Despondency, discouragement, Weariness, tightness, exhaustions, 
And not just natural things, it can be supernatural things that come against you to take you away from the place where God wants you to be. So the children of Israel, they were in a foreign land. They were under occupants of the enemy. He was, he was the one dictating to them. And this is our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. And we are cut off. He says, therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. He's prophesying again. You see, the prophetic word will change the situation. Mm -hmm. And so you need to move just away from general praying to prophesying what the word of God says. To bringing forth his word that will create. Mm -hmm. So he says, <clears throat> this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh my people, I'm going to open your graves <clears throat> bring you up out from them. You ever felt like your life, your ministry, your calling, everything about you is dead and buried? Mm -hmm. Satan thought he had Jesus dead and buried. But Jesus rose from the grave. Amen. The grave could not hold him and the grave could not hold you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to start to rise up. He's buried some of your ministries. He's buried some of your calling. Some of your gifting you haven't seen for so long because it's six foot under. What's happened to some of the gifting you used to use? The enemy's buried it. Well, if Jesus Christ can move in resurrection power, all those giftings can be resurrected in your life. And God wants them to be resurrected. Maybe your hopes, your dreams, who you want you to become. Maybe some of your relationships are buried, they're dead. God can resurrect anything. There is nothing impossible for him. And God is telling Ezekiel to prophesy to When was the last time you prophesied into any area of your life that seemed to be dead? You probably think, well, it's dead, it's buried, it's gone. Let's draw a line in the ground, or dig a hole in the ground, and let's move on. Sometimes you're not going to move on Sometimes you've got to get the shovel out through prophecy and bring back to the surface those things the enemy has buried. And so Ezekiel is, is told to prophesy again. He's to prophesy to the people. Oh my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I'm going to bring you back to the land of Israel. As we know has taken place and still continues to take place but what about you moving in the land of the living the way that god wants you to live in it's almost like we're in a world and you like the world but the bible says you're not to be of the world we're not to love the world or the things of the world we're not to be engrossed with them god isn't interested in what car you're driving he's not interested in how big your houses, how many bathrooms you got. He's not interested in all those little schemes you have to try to improve your standard of living. He's interested in you improving your standard of living by allowing his breath to flow through you. To live for him. For it being your chief desire, your passion in life. <clears throat> Ezekiel prophesied he was obedient to the word of God. And God says that he would bring his people back to the land of Israel. And he will bring you back to the place that is assigned for you. He will bring you back alive and vibrant. God was bringing them back to that place so they could be fruitful again. And God will want to move you back to the place where you were fruitful again for him. And he says, when I open your graves and bring you up from them, I'll put my spirit in you and you will live <clears throat> and I will settle you in a land think about that for a minute God wants to establish you many of you that have traveled from different nations different countries have come to the UK because there's an adjustment in the way that you live it may take you a little while to be settled a little while to be established and you're doing that in your own abilities, making your own contacts, setting some roots down. But God's saying, I'm going to settle you. 
in that line. In other words, I'm going to establish you. Why do people try to establish themselves today? Making names for themselves and reputations. Jesus Christ made himself of no reputation. And yet his reputation is known all over the world today. He made himself of no reputation. We've got to allow God to establish us and settle us in the land, in the place that he desires us to be. And that doesn't just mean a geographic place. It means that you walk with a living God. Maybe you're in a grave right now and you feel that you need that resurrection power of God. But he is able. The Bible says if he raised Christ from the dead, he dwells within you. And he raised Christ from the dead. That's not that resurrection power. Will quicken your mortal body. He'll heal you and restore you. But it's talking about resurrection power. And you've got to start to know that power within your life to live that supernatural life. You cannot do a thing without the presence of God. Mm. And the sooner you realize that, the greater you become in the things of God. Mm. So God is telling him, I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to put my spirit in you and you will live. I'll settle you in your land. Then you will know I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it. Amen. It's for his glory, in other words. Mm -hmm. He does everything for his glory. <clears throat> Don't be trying to take God's glory. And the way you take God's glory at times is taking credit for what God has done. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what Satan did? Yeah. Yeah. We're never to take credit for what God's done. Yeah. Yet, I, yet I prayed for him and he got healed. Mm -hmm. You've never healed a person in your life. You've never delivered anyone. You've no power to save anyone. God just chooses you to be his vessel. Well, didn't he choose a donkey to restrain a, a, a prophet that had gone off the rails? Didn't he use some old rooster to speak to Peter? You might be an old rooster today. He wants to use you. He can use you in any way he wants. Never think it's of your own power, but trust in the Lord. And so God can make from dead, dried up bones that are scattered all over the parish. He can bring them together and he can make an exceedingly great army that's full of his presence and full of his power. He can cause those that see their lives. The enemy thinks he's got you dead, he's got you buried. He can cause you to have a resurrection within your life. So that you can start to flow in the presence of the power of God. And I believe that God is wanting that for his church today. He doesn't want us weary and washed out. He doesn't want us powerless. He wants us to flow in that supernatural life. That's your inheritance. You won't allow someone else just to take your inheritance, would you? You've got to start to fight. You've got to be a bad boy in these areas and fight against the enemy. The Bible tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. That's the only fight you have. You've got to stand on the promises of God. And you're going to have to contend, meaning you're going to have to fight for the blessings of God in your life. But where do you learn to fight? In the fight. God even said to the children of Israel when he entered the promised land, I'm going to leave a few of the enemies behind. Because some of you are not seasoned soldiers. All those that were seasoned soldiers have passed away. Some of these are inexperienced. So I'm going to use the enemy and those skirmishes to train you. It's a scary thing, isn't it? You want training in the things of God? There's going to be some skirmishes along your way. But the great thing is he gives you the power to overcome the enemy. In him and in him alone. He wants his church vibrant and standing. An exceedingly great power. There is not an army in the world like the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I looked yesterday, I was looking at the news where China was displaying their, some of their military might. Mm -hmm. All the drones they have, all the weaponry they have, that is nothing. God laughs at that compared to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They may control lives, but bring the gospel into that nation and it will revolutionize that nation and undermine their work with power in the word of God. Let's pray right now. If you need that resurrection power in, 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 in God, you need to come forward for prayer. 
Maybe you need some resurrection power to get you out of your chair. Amen. Amen. Some Christian can't do that. Then a man once came to me and said, can you pray that I get up in the morning? I said, I'll pray that God will wake you up, but you've got to get your feet out of bed. We have our part to play. Let's just pray. Father, I just want to thank you for the obedience of Ezekiel. So, Lord, even though he was in a place of captivity, he was moved from that place to the place you wanted him to be by the Spirit of God. And he was obedient to your word because he prophesied according to your word. And the very things that he spoke started to happen. Father, even in increments. And I just praise you for that, that Lord, sometimes these increments are blessing. But I pray that your people would never be discouraged with the increments. But Father God, that they would know the fullness of it is coming. And I simply ask again that you would breathe into your people where they feel flat, where they feel empty, where they feel that their best days have gone. Father, where they feel that everything has worked against them and things are dead and buried, I pray for resurrection power in the name of Jesus Christ. That you would start to tell the enemy, it is not over, I'm coming out of the grave. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.